<clears throat> and I first want to mention uh, the folks who are working with me on this. So uh, on the left here, we have Lawrence Lopez, who's in the, on the Zoom meeting today, and he'll be, uh, whoops, that was interesting. Um, he'll be uh, chiming in today uh, at various parts in the talk. Uh, second from left is David Cook with FWC, who's the invertebrate uh, uh, species coordinator. Uh, then in the middle is uh, Steve Sparks, who's uh, uh, someone who's been working on, who's basically my age now and has been working on Ligua since he was 16 years old or something. He hung out with Archie Jones in the old days. Uh, and so these are the people who have been really contributing to the project. And I also want to mention my postdoc, uh, not my postdoc, excuse me, my undergraduate student, um, Stefan Rhodes, uh, who's uh, on the left here, has really been contributing to the project. And then on the right, Deb Jansen, who uh, is kind of a legendary field biologist uh, working at a big cypress. Uh, and so these are all people who've contributed to a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about today. So uh, a little bit of, about myself, I mostly have worked on uh, mollusks, in particular marine mollusks, uh, but I became involved in this flatworm thing uh, basically because of uh, it started happening um, not far from where I live. So I got a call from Dr. Elise Warren, uh, uh, who worked at Castle Hammock, uh, among other places. She's part of Miami-Dade County's Natural Areas Management. And uh, she found that uh, there was this massive mortality going on uh, in one of the parks, uh, Castle, and in particular, uh, one part of Castle called Castle 33. And, uh, you know, there were just hundreds and hundreds of uh, recently dead snails laying all around uh, in Castle 33. And it used to be a pretty happy place for ligulous tree snails, our native tree snails. So she was concerned. So I went out with with uh, Elise, uh, we found uh, this very large flatworm. Uh, and, and this flatworm was in many cases in the aperture of recently dead snails. This was a snail that was about eight feet up in the tree uh, with this flatworm nestled in the aperture. And they were crawling around uh, you know, the site and, and uh, so it became pretty obvious that these uh, flatworms were having a dramatically negative impact on Castle Hammock. And we've been looking at following the hammock uh, for years since then. And this site, which used to be, as I say, a very happy place for uh, Ligulus, uh, they're now super, super rare. So what is Platydemus? Uh, it's a terrestrial planarian or flatworm. Uh, like most flatworms, it's pretty flat, but actually a lot more beefy than some of them. It has kind of a D-shaped profile. If you slice through it, it's flat on the bottom and then arches over in the top. It tapers at both ends, of course, but it tapers more acutely anteriorly. And you can see a couple of protruding eye spots here and uh, its little sensory papillae uh, around the mouth. And so these things, uh, they're primarily nocturnal uh, um, and they like warm, moist weather and they're active predators. So uh, if you see these things at night and they're looking for prey, you'll often see that anterior, you know, the head area sweeping back and forth over the substrate, looking for mostly snail trails. And when they find a snail trail, they follow that snail trail to the end and about half the time there's a snail uh, at the end of it. So, <clears throat> and uh, these uh, flatworms have been introduced in many other parts of the world. And in some places, uh, as in, uh, you know, this picture here in Ogasawara Islands in Japan, they've turned out to be a real, uh, uh, to have a major impact on the uh, communities of, of uh, snails and other uh, terrestrial invertebrates uh, where they've been introduced. And I should say, uh, if anybody has any questions at any point, just, just chime in. I, I want this to be relatively informal. Uh, Tim, just to add something to what you, you said right now about, you know, the um, Ogasawara Islands in Japan, 
they actually tested, you know, uh, NGF, the New Guinea flatworm, uh, how fast they actually ate, you know, the snails there. And in three days, 50% of all land snails that, you know, they were testing uh, were actually eaten. So they really devour, you know, the snail communities and they did that there in the Ogasawara Islands. Yeah, thanks, Lars. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a little bit on the appearance of the snails, and this can be, uh, excuse me, uh, of the flatworms, and this can be confusing at first. Uh, at night, uh, they look, so they're kind of chestnut colored, and they have this lighter dorsal stripe. And if you flip them over, there's also a faint ventral stripe. But during the day, uh, their appearance is dramatically different. They look uh, almost like a drip of tar. So they're almost completely black. This is the same snail. You can see there, there's the interior eye spots and the proboscis. And when you flip them over, you can see that it's lighter colored and there's that uh, ventral mid uh, line as well. Um, so depending on when you see them, they can look pretty dramatically different. As far as size goes, you know, saying how big these things are is kind of like asking how long a slinky is, right? So it depends on, on when you look at it. Uh, but we've, you know, here's a scale bar in centimeters on the left and inches on the right. And we found them as big as eight centimeters or so. So there, it's, it's a relatively large, relatively beefy uh, flatworm. Here's when you look at it ventrally, it's much lighter. Um, and I want to mention that uh, flatworms, uh, New Guinea flatworms, like most flatworms, have a mid ventral proboscis that comes out. And this is what they use for feeding. And but by both chemical and muscular mechanical action, they force that proboscis into the uh, body of their prey and uh, de devour them. Um, uh, down from the mid-ventral proboscis, uh, uh, about halfway towards the tail, is also a gonopore. These things are hermaphroditic uh, and uh, um, produce both males and females. Um, the, uh, after having sex, they produce these cocoons which are, they almost look like little seeds when you first see them, they're opaque when they first have, and they can have, uh, uh, depending, you know, the, the, they can be as small as two millimeters, as big as, a, as a five millimeters, and uh, with smaller flatworms making smaller cocoons and larger flatworms making bigger cocoons. And um, these uh, cocoons, um, uh, can uh, carry two to five little flatworms in them. And here is a picture of a one that's further along in the development. You can see it's fairly translucent and you can actually see the flatworms, the, the larval flatworms moving around in the cocoon. And I've got a little video here where you can actually see these things moving around. And here's one more, one more terrible video. This this thing hatched while I was looking at it, so it was running around like whoop. So I apologize for the quality of the video, but you can actually see the uh, juvenile flatworms uh, hatching from the cocoon. They hatch at about eight millimeters in size and uh, uh, grow pretty quickly. As I say, we found them eight to 10 centimeters in size. And then here's a picture of one just recently uh, after having crawled out of the cocoon. 
again, about eight millimeters in length. So, as I said, the reason that we were really interested in them is because they really are uh, active predators of, of, of our tree snail and land snail, both our native tree snails and land snails, and also any other introduced snails. And in fact, as you'll see, they'll, they'll eat uh, many other terrestrial invertebrates if they can get a hold of them. And so here is a New Guinea flatworm on the uh, side of a tree. And here's one of our native tree snails, Trimaeus multilineatus. And you can see that the snail has arranged itself so that uh, its uh, mid ventral proboscis is near the aperture of the snail and it's feeding on the snail. Uh, similarly, here's another one of our native snails, Microceramus pontificus. And again, you know, the, the flatworm has arranged, has arranged itself so that it can bring its uh, proboscis in alignment with the snail to feed on it. Um, <clears throat> here's another uh, New Guinea flatworm, in this, in this case, feeding on a, one of our native uh, leather leaf slugs. Uh, here, feeding on an earthworm. And one of the interesting features of these uh, flatworms is they uh, have this sort of gang-like behavior where they'll feed in large numbers on uh, a particular prey item. So this is part of the shell of Zacrecia provisoria, a, a, a non-native or introduced snail in Florida. And it's just basically buried in this uh, cluster of New Guinea flatworms. And here's another picture, uh, the, the, this one taken by Lawrence. And uh, it, it, there was such a mass of them that you couldn't really see what was being preyed upon. Uh, at first, uh, Lawrence was wondering if this might be some sort of mating aggregation, but it turns out that there was a flatworm in the middle of this mess. They are supposed to uh, have also receptors, chemical receptors, and then uh, follow trails. So um, they have been tested to follow uh, snail trails, but we're not sure yet if they can follow um, earthworm trails. Mm -hmm. And I should say, you know, we have found them um, eating uh, dead things, carrion. Uh, and uh, Lawrence can give you the whole long list of the various kinds of invertebrates that, that he's seen them eating. Um, and uh, in one case, um, Lawrence thinks that they might have been actually been eating fruit. So they seem, uh, they prefer snails. That seems to be what they mostly like to eat. But in a pinch, it seems like they'll eat almost anything that they can catch. Is that fair, Lawrence? Yeah, I agree, Tim. And um... Uh, Tim, uh, David, and I went recently to one of these conserved parks, uh, Bill Sadowski in Miami-Dade County, and we actually saw the uh, New Guinea flatworm even going outside the actual uh, forest, all over in the sidewalks, and you know, trying to actually look for practically everything they could. And you know, Bill Sadowski doesn't have snails. Uh, New Guinea flatworm um, in some tests, they are, you know, they prefer snails over earthworms and so on. So, yeah, they can actually, you know, be uh, uh, even necrophagous or eating carrion and look for anything but just to eat. And they can survive for a long time in captivity. They can even survive all the way to two years uh, without food. That's actually pretty amazing. They can cocoon, they can cocoon themselves also so that probably with that, um, the strategy they can survive, you know, for, for longer periods of time. Um, we, uh, early on, one hope was that, uh, well, maybe the tree snails wouldn't uh, have much to worry about from the New Guinea flatworm because uh, they, they wouldn't go up into trees. They were basically terrestrial, but we found uh, out fairly quickly that they go pretty far up in trees. And here's an example. Here's a picture of Stefan. And uh, he's using his meter stick to point to a New Guinea flatworm that's about four meters up this tree. So they go pretty far up into the trees. This is practically a, a record, guys, since, you know, I, I, 
uh, based, on, based on the literature anyway, uh, they were recorded to go all the way to two meters in you know, these Japanese islands, which is, by the way, a, a World Heritage Site, the Okasawa Island. So this is an actual record of how high they can actually go. Okay, um, and I want to, you know, mention one of the things we've been doing. And so during our project, we're surveying the native tree snails by doing transects. But when we find uh, flatworms at a particular site, uh, we do randomly selected quadrats. And uh, using a five square meter quadrat, we uh, count that we look for uh, flatworms for 10 minutes in that quadrat and uh this is the shows the densities of um new guinea flatworms in various uh locations that we've looked at and you know so you find densities sometimes six to eight or more uh individuals per square meter and of course this is you know a, a minimum right we don't find every single snail in those uh quadrats in 10 minutes so it's useful as an index of abundance for comparison among sites. And uh, you can see that there's a, a lot of variation. Uh, the one pattern that seemed pretty clear to us so far is that they tend to be in higher abundance in areas uh, uh, that are uh, uh, nearer human development and, and less abundance outside those areas. And uh, to add to that, Tim, uh, we are to analyze uh, the correlations that uh, might be happening between these densities and the densities of snails. And if you actually check there for some of these bars, uh, for example, Castle 33 uh, down in the left, and then Deer and State in the middle, you can see high densities there, and that correlates with actually no snails at all, where you know they actually were. Uh, you found population of snails there, of so tree snails, ligius, especially in Orthalicus, and now, you know, none of them. If you see Castle Park there in Matheson, the populations of snails there are very, very low compared, compared to, you know, these uh, control areas that we're studying. So it may seem that there's, there's going to be a correlation, you know, between uh, densities of New Guinea flatworms and the densities of uh, tree snails. I see there's a question in the, in the chat of what is the best way to kill them. And um, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I mean, if you find an individual one, uh, um, you can just put it in some alcohol. I mean, that's the way we usually collect them. If you're asking more broadly the question, like if you have them in your yard, how do you get rid of them? That's a tougher question than one that we're working on. Um, there are no uh, listed pesticides for New Guinea flatworms right now. So, um, uh, you know, there, there are people who will go out and spray for them, but there's nothing that's listed for them. Um, there are various things that have been discussed. Uh, diatomaceous earth uh, is one that would be relatively innocuous for most other things. Um, but uh, we, don't, we don't have a good answer to the question, what's the best way to eliminate them from a broader area? Um, another pattern that I just wanted to mention for the New Guinea flatworms is, is that um, you won't be surprised that there's uh, a lot of uh, annual variation in their densities. And so uh, right now, this is, you know, this is the time of year, the summer, when you're really, if you want to see some flatworms, if you wonder if you have them in your area, this is absolutely the time to go out and look for them. And so they're much more abundant in the summer and then taper off quite a bit during the winter. So if you want to see some flatworms, um, go out between sort of eight o'clock and 11 o'clock in the evening uh, and, and stroll through the area that you're interested in with a flashlight. Um, uh, you know, particularly if it's been recently raining, uh, you might see, you'll see them if they're in the area. Because, uh, you know, I've been to places where you walk through them during the day and through it during the day. And, and yeah, you see one here and there if you flip over a log or something like that. But you go back on a night at night, particularly a rainy night, and the place will just be loaded, loaded with them. So uh, uh, as I say, if you're, if you're 
interested in knowing whether or not they're in your area. Th this is a this is a time. You and another thing, Tim, there uh, looking at this graph is, guys, you, you can see that even in uh, winter months, you know, uh, February, March, January, you still encounter a few of them uh, in some of these sites, for example, Castle Proper there in Matheson. So, uh, you know, that tells you uh, how these guys, this, this new Guinea Falcon can still be active you know, some of them anyway, uh, even at, uh, in winter. Owasa Bauer, you see there, you know, plenty of zeros there. Uh, this is an area that also contains uh, pine land, um, uh, rock land there in that, that habitat. So maybe that um, variable there is attributing it to, you know, having zero zeros uh, there. So, but we're, we're still studying that as well. Okay, um, because Emily asked more generally about flatworms and mentioned the hammerhead flatworm, uh, I, we thought we'd, meant, we'd talk about some of the other flatworms. That, of course, as we're out looking for New Guinea flatworms, other things have turned up. Uh, in particular, uh, the hammerhead flatworm uh, by Paleum vagum uh, is uh, seen on the trunk of a tree here. Uh, you can see that it's called a hammerhead because it has this flared head with eye spots at either end. Uh, um, there's also a, a, a second species by Paleum cuensis that's reported from Florida. These are also uh, snail eating flatworms. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at and we're interested and concerned with these other flatworms, but so far we've found that the numbers of New Guinea flatworms, uh, at, at least in the places we're looking, dramatically outnumber uh, the numbers of. Uh, uh, other species of flatworms. So we occasionally will see uh, a hammerhead flatworm, but uh, I mean, when we go out at these places at night, we are quite commonly seeing the New Guinea flatworms. Uh, we're also finding uh, species that at least I was unaware of before we started working on this. Here's a, a image of a uh, Anisorhynchodemus Halesii, that's what we think it is anyway, at this point. I should mention that we are uh, collaborating with a, um, a morphologist, um, Lee Windsor at, in Australia, who's giving us a lot of good advice on that. And we're also doing DNA barcodes on all these things to try to nail down the identifications. Uh, so this, this uh, if this is does turn out to be Anisorhynchus halesii, that's originally described from the Philippines. And my guess is that most of these things are coming in as so many other species do on uh, agricultural products, you know, uh, you know, plants that people bring in as ornamentals, that sort of thing. Uh, here's another one. Uh, we think this is Dolicoplana striata uh, of Indo-Malaysian origin. Uh, and this is another one we found crawling through the leaf litter at night. Uh, yet another one, uh, Cenoplana sp. There's many different species of Cenoplana, and uh, we're not sure which one this is at this point. And for the Cenoplana team, also they have a Australian origin, so you could imagine, you know, they traveled the whole entire world to now us uh, seeing them here. Um, and I wanted to mention, uh, because Emily had said that uh, folks were interested in answering questions about these, if you go to iNaturalist, you can find listings for some of these. Uh, you know, we can't verify the uh, validity of any particular uh, occurrence, uh, but, um, you know, you can go to iNaturalist and see if they've been reported from your area. So here's Bipalium vagum, and here's Platydemus manicwari. And, uh, you know, at least in the case of Platydemus, it looks pretty apparent that their abundance is, it seems to be correlated with high human population densities. And uh, I know this is a, a talk about flatworms, but uh, we have to mention that we've also found terrestrial nemertians, right? So this is a different phylum of worm. Uh, this is Geonemertes paleensis. And, uh, you can see that this has this dark uh, dorsal stripe, uh, and you can see the little 
uh, eye spots or a celly at the anterior end. And the thing that really uh, sets this one apart from the flatworms is that, as in other Nemertians, it has an anterior proboscis that it shoots out uh, to prey on items. And so uh, when we first found this many years ago, we were trying to identify it as some sort of flatworm. And, uh, and, and while we're looking at it under the microscope, this proboscis shoots out the front end. And we, so at that point, we realized that we we're dealing with something very different. And they're actually fairly rare. Almost all other Nemertians or ribbon worms are marine. So this is really, it's kind of an, uh, uh, a biological oddity as well. And it's, uh, it has a worldwide distribution now, guys. So it's here in Florida. And you know, based on some research already, not necessarily here in Florida, but in other places, they are disturbing the uh, soil ecology of you know, different areas. So yeah, we have this emerging now that is an alien species and might be also a, a problem. Right, and 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 preys on snails. Yeah. And so that brings me uh, back to the point that uh, our focus on these flatworms uh, is really uh, in terms of trying to preserve our native tree snails. Here's an Orthalicus rhesus from Big Cypress, and. Uh, so we are trying to uh, map out the distribution of our native tree snails and try to find populations that are still very happy there and think of ways that we can prevent the further introduction of uh, New Guinea flatworms and other flatworms into these areas where there's still relatively happy, abundant populations of our native tree snails. And with that, I want to mention the folks who are supporting this work and have helped us out with it. Uh, so the FWC has been supporting this research. Uh, we are collaborating with Elise Warren, Stefan Rhodes, my undergraduate, Deb Jansen at Big Cypress, Tony Pernis, who actually recently retired, um, Phil and Dean, Jeremy Dixon, Scott Tedford, Jeanette Parker, Suzanne Roebling, and Trudy Ferraro. And uh, we've had a lot of help from uh, concerned citizens who have provided reports and samples of these things uh, that have helped us uh, dramatically in our work. And we also want to acknowledge Lee Windsor for uh, giving us um, helpful advice on the systematics of flatworms. And with that, I'll close with a, uh, a nice watercolor of Liguus fasciatus uh, from Castle 33. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that, uh, that I can. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, so I definitely have a few questions. Uh, anybody else, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box um, or use the raise your hand uh, function on the, um, the Zoom option and we will we'll go ahead and, uh, and work through those. Um, I have kind of, I think like a two-parter. Um, the first question came to me, it's something I feel like I should know, but are there any native flatworms in Florida? I don't know of any, at least in South Florida. Um, um, you know, South Florida is, re you know, up until, you know, not too many thousands of years ago was underwater. So uh, uh, I, I, I am, I'm not at this point aware of any native flatworms in Florida. And Emily, the uh, question can be extended to, let's say, North America. Mm -hmm. And there are discussions for one species, uh, Rincodemus sylvaticus. And um, they have found it mainly on the northern states, northeast states. But there's also discussion that probably that species also came from Europe. So there might be essentially not a native uh, uh, flatworm in all of North America, maybe even. Okay. Um, and how do you guys have any guesses on how these things are spreading and how they might get into? new areas or, or extend how, or how fast they're spreading as far as their capability to get further into forested areas that they may not be already? You, you know, the reported um, dispersal ability of these things is pretty limited uh, on the scale of tens to a few hundreds of meters a year. Uh, so uh, their, their rapid apparent spread through the state is almost certainly the result of human activity. So, you know, getting spread around on uh, agricultural or ornamental plants, 
Uh, you know, they could also be moved. Uh, you know, if you have heavy equipment that is working in, say, one park area and, and they go through the and, and get all muddy and dirty and included in that could be either flatworms or their cocoons and then they're transferred to other areas. So their, their, their intrinsic ability to disperse seems fairly limited. Uh, and so it's almost certainly uh, being aided by human, by human activity. And so, you know, uh, we found them in potted plants at Home Depot, you know, and not to pick on Home Depot, I'm sure it's true in other places as well. Uh, we found in mulch, you know, and so, uh, yeah, my, my strong guess is that uh, most of the dispersal is, is being uh, aided by humans. And, and I think that the fact that we find them in the highest densities around human populations suggests that that's, that's the case as well. Great. So it sounds like the primary concern right now, um, and that they are actually having a current, a current environmental impact, which is decreasing these populations of native snails. Um, you and I chatted about this really briefly before we got started today, but can you just hit on some of the potential public health issues? And if, uh, you know, if there is reason for concern, and, and if so, kind of what should the approach to that be? Right. So, yeah, we, we did talk about that a little bit earlier. When when the New Guinea flatworm first appeared, uh, and and they are known in other parts of the world to carry uh, angiostrongylus, uh, the rat lungworm, which can infect humans and, and cause significant uh, uh, disease. Um, uh, there there was uh, there were some newspaper articles and other things published that were kind of alarmist and said that, you know, if you see a flatworm, dial 911 and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And so um, people, you know, I, I know the folks at FWC were fielding a lot of calls, you know, oh, I found one in my yard, you know, should I set it on fire, you know, these kind of things. Um, and, and, and it is a valid concern, uh, but I would also point out that our native uh, and, and, uh, and introduced snail populations also carry uh, angiostrongylus. And in fact, if, if flatworms have them, they probably get them by uh, feeding on, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the snail. So it is a concern. You know, we try to handle them with our bare hands. If you do handle them, don't touch your face or your eyes or, or your mouth. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're found in both uh, terrestrial species and sometimes in freshwater species. Um, so it, it is a, a, a significant health concern, but not any worse than the concerns that we have about uh, handling uh, snails. Great, thank you. All right, so and, go ahead, Lawrence. And Emily, I think you know that's uh, something that needs to be studied. So we've been also talking with Tim and our team and see if you know there could be a chance even to get. Uh, you know, run these primers, you know, for angiostrangulus and see if uh, there's um, something that, you know, we can found or find that is significant. And, you know, if we can actually do that, maybe that, you know, can also contribute to your question. Absolutely. Thank you. So we had two questions pop in the chat box here. Um, so starting with, is there a known natural predator for these flatworms or specifically the New Guinea flatworm? Yeah, so uh, this was originally re uh, reported from the, uh, a field station, an agricultural field station in New Guinea. Um, and, and so it, it's assumed that that's where it's from. Uh, but um, uh, there's almost nothing, no, but, but you know, again, this was an agricultural station, so things have been moved into there. So whether or not it even is from there is not 100% clear, at least to me. Um, so um, no, I don't, I don't know about their native predators, uh, but uh, there are several reports in the literature uh, indicating that these things taste terrible. So there are reports of, you know, say chickens eating them and then throwing up violently and then refusing to go near them again and things like that. So, uh, and, and I have not done the experiment, I must say, I have not attempted to taste the New Guinea flatworm, uh, 
uh, but they are they are reported to to be unpalatable. So um, so yes, you know that. Oh, go ahead, Lawrence. Uh, you know, there's a paper, guys. Uh, it's pretty interesting. There's a um, species of carnivorous snail, but it's in the tropics. It's in South America. And it's one that uh, it's eating the native flatworms there, but it has also eaten invasive or alien flatworms there. So, um, I mean, I guess as a as just a perspective here, but you know, that carnivorous snail would be one of those predators. The other idea would be, again, which is a very complex subject, but you know, uh, using biocontrols and so on. But again, that's something of a different uh, level. So we do have a common carnivorous, correct me if I'm wrong here, a common carnivorous snail in the, the rosy wolf snail. Mm -hmm. So is there any evidence that those might eat a flatworm? Not that I'm aware of. And, and in fact, you know, it, it's a funny thing. Uh, um, at least in South Florida, uh, the rosy wolf snail is not at all common. Mm. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, in some parts of northern Florida, they're more abundant. Uh, but um, uh, we see them very rarely in developed areas. Uh, when we go out, well, like if we helicopter out to, you know, some of these more remote tree islands, the big cypress and places like that, we'll see, uh, you know, happy uh, rosy wolf snails, euglandina, but uh, we, we don't see them commonly here. Um, uh, we, we, uh, if, if we could do that experiment, we could, we could put some rosy wolf snails, if someone would give us permission to do that, since it's a native snail, we could put some rosy wolf snails in with, uh, in with the, some New Guinea flatworms, and maybe it'll be like the alligator python story again, you know, it's like, we'll get to see who eats who. Um, uh, True. An interesting idea, but as I say, we, uh, we, it's, it's pretty rare to encounter uh, the rosy wolf snail in any of the um, sites we see in the coastal part of uh, Florida. It's only when we get into the remote parts of the Everglades or Big Cypress that we see them. Well, then I'm going to count myself floor, uh, lucky up here in Northeast Florida that I have them in my yard because uh, I think they're pretty cool. Um, <laughs> second part of that question uh, is, you stated that this species is able to detect snail trails. Do you know if they are able to detect, to detect which direction to follow, if, i.e. if the snail is coming or going? Not, not that I know of. The, there's actually there's a paper there. We can dig that out and, uh, and send that to you. But they, they did a little study where they made little Y-shaped things and painted snail trail on one side and nothing on the other. And they, they followed the trail. Um, but uh, as far as I know, they just follow the trail and, you know, half the time they're on track and half the time they're not. Okay. Um, so the last question we have in the chat box, and again, anybody else, feel free to hop in uh, here. But following up on, on the question that you answered earlier about the best way to manage them, um, you mentioned alcohol. Um, but what about freezing? Is that a, you know, collecting them and putting them in, in the freezer? Is that a viable uh, sure, sure, you could do that, but I mean, for the reasons we discussed about the angiostrongulus, I don't think you'd want to be putting that in a in, in the same place where you keep your food. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I th I think that would be very effective as a way to kill them. But you know, uh, you know, I mean, the other thing, um, you know, Lawrence's wife found one in their backyard one day and just went out and sprinkled salt all over it, and that was uh, killed it very effectively. Uh, so that you know that they're not that hard to kill uh but I, I i i guess my suggestion would be that we not put it around your food that's a fair point so are there any resources that you're aware of or programs uh kind of actively encouraging homeowners to manage these in their landscape in that way to say hey if you have these consider and i'm thinking of similar to how we often do with cuban tree frogs like if you have cuban tree frogs here's the way to uh, you know, dispatch them humanely. Um, do you feel like it's something homeowners should be 
kind of actively engaged with helping stem the tide of invasion on these? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there, as I say, there are a fair number of concerned homeowners who get in touch with us, but uh, I, I, uh, it, well, it's an interesting question if we could get people stoked enough to, to go out and, and go flatworm hunting at night. Uh, I suppose if you were persistent in that, uh, you, you might make inroads in the populations, uh, especially, you know, times of year like this when they're really uh, most, most apparent. Um, but uh, no, we, have, we haven't uh, tried that. It's actually in the to-do list, uh, Emily, <laughs> so that we can even, uh, uh, you know, ask for grants and keep mm -hmm. working on this. And I, I just had uh, one more thing to add to the um, uh, topic about uh, Yul and Dina, the rosy wolf. And there's discussions, at, you know, with Tim, David, uh, that maybe even the um, populations of this species might have been also uh, shocked in a way by NGF. I mean, so it could be also the other way around that the NGF is eating the euglandina. Very interesting. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, so if you guys have them, pop them in. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys so much. It was fascinating um, and really appreciate the work y'all are doing on this as well. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I have a few uh, quick updates on, on our side, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and do that. Let me just make sure, yep, okay, great. Um, so let me get my screen back up. All right, well, thanks for having us. Great, thank, thank you guys. Okay. Sorry, let me get my screen set up. So um, yeah, thanks again. That was just a fantastic presentation. Um, so I have a few just real quick updates on the FISC side. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of bring up and note is uh, there are a number of transitions happening um, and you may or may not have been included in some of these discussions we've been having with FISP, uh, our steering committee, as well as the Florida Invasive Species Council. Um, so we are in a process of basically merging uh, these two organizations um, in a way in which FISP, the partnership, uh, will kind of fold into the, a wing of the Florida Invasive Species Council, uh, formerly FLEPSI. And so our hope is that this will uh, just uh, increase uh, collaboration and connection and, uh, and, and efficiency uh, you know, in the places where some of our roles overlap. Um, and so we, uh, some more information to come on that uh, as it's available. Um, one thing that has been done is we have merged our listservs. So many of you are here today because uh, partly because you get my email notifications from the Florida CISMAS listserv. There is also a Florida EPSI, FLEPSI listserv. I can't remember exactly what the title was. And it has in the past been a more active email list, but more recently has um, not been as as active. So what we have done with those is we have merged them into a single list and it's called Florida Invasives. I will send out an email later today from that listserv. Mm -hmm. um, and that will also be, that will replace kind of the, the CISMA listserv that, that my emails go out to. Um, and so it'll be one in the same for both groups. It'll essentially still be used the same as it is now. Don't anticipate a huge uh, change in that, but just an, uh, FYI, or, you know, an FYI that that will look a little bit different when it comes to your inbox. Um, we will also be doing some uh, kind of rebranding, consistent branding with social media. Um, but I also guess that I will share here some, some uh, news on my part, which is that I will actually be transitioning out of the Florida Invasive Species Coordinator role here uh, at the end of this month. Um, I've taken a, a new position with the Florida Wildflower Foundation, so I will be uh, helping with communications uh, with that group. And so um, right now, I'm not 100% sure what that will look like in the short term for uh, this and CISMA coordination. 
Um, but I just wanted to give folks a heads up and uh, really just kind of a stay tuned as things uh, will kind of change and evolve with the group. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep, uh, you know, kind of keep your eye on this space and uh, exciting things to come. So um, it has just been an absolute uh, just honor and pleasure to work with everybody in this uh, arena. And, uh, you know, I'm not going too far outside of the, the I'm staying within Florida Conservation, so I certainly hope to continue working with, with many of you. Um, so uh, I'll be around. Um, and I also actually hope to kind of, once I get my feet on the ground uh, with the new organization, sorry about the dog barking, um, I hope to stay involved with the Florida Invasive Species Council. So yeah, uh, won't get rid of me that easily. Um, just real quick, some uh, upcoming events. Um, you can find these on our, the, the links to these on our website under the events calendar, but I just wanted to highlight um, there is a Kogan grass workshop coming up in July in Sarasota, July 12th. Um, the Everglades Invasive Species Summit uh, is scheduled for July 19th through 20th, and they just sent out their uh, uh, link for registration, I think, last week, so check that out. Um, also, Southwest Florida SISMA saved the date for their annual symposium on September 16th. I don't think they have their registration link live yet, but probably any day. So keep an eye out for that. And as you can see, some other uh, events coming up. Summer is uh, gearing up and, uh, and into fall. So lots of good stuff. Um, just a reminder that the Florida Invasive Species Council Education Grant is still open. The deadline is uh, that looks like this Friday. Uh, so just letting folks know and that all this information was also in the SISMA email that went out today. So um, if you need that information, just let me know. Um, but just wanted to keep that on your radar. And then uh, finishing out the call schedule for the rest of the year next month, we have Jessica Spencer with US Army Corps uh, to talk about kind of how the Army Corps uh, works with um, invasive species and, and the, the just vast amount of work they do in Florida. Um, then we're gonna hear from the US, uh, UF IFAS Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants in August and uh, from Dr. Lawrence with UF on her horizon scanning in September. Um, look for, there will likely be a new uh, Zoom link for these. Uh, I'll, I'll be working on kind of handing those calls over. So um, just keep in mind uh, to keep an eye on the emails regarding these calls because uh, in the past, the it's just been one Zoom link from me. Um, we'll also, if you if you rely on a calendar announcement from these calls that uh, some of the FISP steering committee folks have, that will probably need to change as well. So just a heads up, uh, keep an eye on the new um, information for that. Um, Sarah Funk popped in the chat box to note that the Florida that the 2022 Florida Python Challenge has been announced. Um, thank you, Sarah, for adding that. That's a great announcement. Um, the competition will be August 5th through the 14th, and you can check out floridapythonchallenge.org for more info. Uh, so good stuff all around. Um, I think that's all I've got for today. Just a reminder that um, these calls are posted on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can find that on our website as well on the SISMA calls page. So um, this one as well will go up in the next few days. And um, oh, and that's it. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks again to uh, Tim and Lawrence for that just absolutely fantastic information. Um, I think it was really helpful for everyone in our group. And um, Diane, I hear that shout out for a topic of torpedo grass. That's a great one. Uh, I'll definitely uh, capture that. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.